Um, so you guys check out the fundraiser out there. That's for Detroit, right? Yeah. And uh, remember, just keep in the back of your minds, man, the men's advance. Uh, that's something that uh, it's going to. So I don't know if you guys know, we got a couple speakers uh, already plugged in. So we're going to have we're going to actually have Ed Taylor. He's going to fly out and uh, from Colorado, right? And then um, we have Ray Liu from Santa Calvary Ch Chapel, Santa Fe Springs. They're going to come. And uh, so it's going to be really cool. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it, man. Uh, <clears throat> and so, so yeah, we got a couple speakers lined up. Got a, and then, of course, we'll, some of us will be doing some talks. But it's going to be a really cool time, man. So just pray about it. And um, hopefully you guys could, to, could make it. Um, also, before we get into the word, <clears throat> I just want to, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, I just want to lift up in prayer, uh, uh, Don, where are you at, Mr. Wittig? Is he in here right now? No? He's out there? He's probably out there eating still, huh? Or in the prayer room. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but it doesn't matter. I want to pray for him. His sons are really going through it. Uh, one has a heart problem. Another one, I think, has a brain problem. And uh, they're going to go through surgery and stuff. He, he hit me up right now uh, in the back, and I just thought, man, let's just pray together for him. You know, he's a, he's a good bro, and... He just really trusts in the Lord for what's going on in his kids' lives. So let's just pray for him, his sons really quick. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. And, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do pray for our brother Don, Lord, for his, his kids, Lord. They're his sons. And, uh, Lord, no matter what age you are, no matter what's going on, uh, your sons are your sons, Lord. And, and we just pray that you would have your protecting hand on the surgery and these things that are involving the brain and his other son with the heart, Lord, that you would go before the surgeries and all these things that they have to go through. And really, Lord, we pray that you would empower Don and his wife to give them the strength that, and the, the ability they need to endure what's taking place in their lives. And sometimes you see people you don't even know what they're going through. Um, but Lord, we lift them up to you as our brother, and we just pray that you would uh, bring your peace and, and power and, Lord, healing touch to his family. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, guys, let's get through it. Genesis chapter 32. Uh, I was just talking to somebody recently that I haven't seen in a few years. And uh, I was telling him, uh, I said, yeah, man. He's like, how's the man's study going? I'm like, good. I think we're going Genesis chapter 32. He's like, you're still in Genesis, bro? I'm like, and it's been like a few years since I've seen him. I'm like, that's right, man. Well, that was kind of a reality check. Um, Genesis chapter 32 uh, really interesting. We're reading verse 1 through 12 tonight. Um, kind of a really relevant topic about uh, what it means to walk in the promise and the victories of God, man. Like, okay, so it's, it's just unfortunate that it's common today to have sort of a powerless relationship with the Lord. It, it really is. It's unfortunate that today in the church... Uh, even it doesn't matter what church. I'm not pointing out a certain church or whatever. I'm talking about church in general, even our church. Uh, you're going to have and find brothers and people you know that just kind of have a powerless walk with God, where there's more defeat in their lives than there is victory, where there's more sorrow and struggle and trial than there is uh, success and peace. And, uh, you know, there's, there's something about uh, this life that weighs very heavy on people today. There's something about life and the fears and the things that the enemy does that really is just trying to steal away from every man out there the peace and the joy that, that God, and Christ, uh, through Christ his Son, has for us today. There is. Uh, it's, it's a, it surrounds us. This feeling of failure or fear, or this, it surrounds us, these thoughts of, of giving up, these thoughts of the walk being real heavy. You know, that's an indication when your walk with God is heavy and it's weighing on your shoulders and it's monotonous or it's even boring. That's a sign that you're doing a lot uh, to maintain this walk with God. And that's a sign that it's you and the resources that you have and the power that you have is the supply of your walk with God. And that's the sign 
And that's the reason why we have weak relationships going on with the Lord, because it's not meant to be our power. It's not meant to be our strength. It's not meant to be our resources that are going to provide this type of victory or this type of peace, because then it's you doing it, not God. So the enemy knows this. He's very, very tricky. He knows how to deceive the mind of a man. He knows what to do. He knows how to cause fear. He knows how to stir up, you know, us to get into this mode of needing to do something. He knows how to do all that already. And so when we take the bait, then all of a sudden we begin to take on uh, this walk with the Lord. And the promises of God, they're, they're just a, a verse to us. They're just a conversation. They're not a reality. The victory is not a reality. The promise is not a reality. So tonight is another opportunity for us as readers to see, well, what is it then? How, Lord, teach me. Show us the way. Show us to, to live in this power. Show us to, to walk in the promise. But show us also, Lord, the things to be uh, aware of. Because, guys, if we put our guard down, and if we begin to just walk this Christian walk, and it's no longer like a, you know, I, I love Paul and how he describes the Christian walk. When you look at Paul, he describes the walk. Most of the time, it's either he's describing it as a soldier. He's describing it as one who is an athlete. He's always describing the Christian walk as somebody who is, is having to be active and having to be alert and having to be strong. And having to always constantly be on guard. And I like how he does it because he knew something. Paul understood that the enemy is constantly attacking the mind. Constantly attacking our lives. And if we are not on guard. If we're not feeling the sense of alertness. Then you will find yourself at a sense of laziness. A sense of a monotonous walk. A, a, a walk that doesn't have the power that God is. God is power. He's the burning bush that doesn't consume itself, a supernatural entity. That's who God is. And that power is, exists and is offered to every person who believes on him, that, li that living power. But how often does the walk, when we look in the mirror, feel and seem so powerless? And the trials come and the afflictions come, and you often sometimes feel powerless against them. And you start going, man, I need something going on here, man. I need to take an energy drink. I need to do something different because I need to experience God. I need to experience some excitement and some joy. I need to drink some coffee, man. You know, and, and that, that's, your, that's, your, that's your energy for the moment. Let's read verse 1, chapter 32. So it says, and Jacob went on his way. Now, we know Jacob, man. He, he's coming out of a gnarly situation. He's leaving Laban, right? We know that. We know that he's... Now going to uh, uh, back home, right? Because that's what God told him to do. Time to take your wives and everything you have, and it's time to go home now. So it's saying that he's on his way. And notice what our chapter is. This is an important thing to notice. What it's starting off by saying. Jacob is, went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, so this wasn't just a, a, a supernatural, invisible thing happening. When he saw them, he said, this is God's host, and he called the name of that place Mahan Naim. See, the Mahan Naim means to host. He identified. He says, whoa, I'm, I'm, going, I'm leaving now this crazy situation with Laban. I'm leaving this deceitful situation that me and Laban just broke it off. I don't even care about the bro. He doesn't care about me much. And now, for some reason or another, on his way back home, God decides to make it known to Jacob that God has some angels with him, some hosts with him, some heavenly hosts are with him, man, like, like some supernatural things are happening. I was just telling my sons the other night, if we're able to have those supernatural glasses and we put them on, we would see the warfare and everything else going on around us. We would see the demonic powers around us uh, messing with our minds. We would see the angels making battle for us. As it says over in Psalms 91.11, I, I, that scripture is really interesting. It, who know, uh, Psalms 91.11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And I tell my son, you would see it because it's written in the word. 
He's saying his angels are there to take charge of us. It's actually happening. There is a spiritual thing going down around every single one of us. And if we were all in this room to put on our little spiritual goggles, imagine what we would see be going on above us in this room right now. We'd be seeing war. And so God is saying to Jacob now on his way back after leaving Laban in the situation, he's saying, I want you to know something for certain. I'm with you. I'm with you. I have my angels with you. I have people with you going. I have a spiritual, supernatural power that's with you. You need to recognize it, Jacob. See, it almost is, a, it almost is like a, a Sunday school story for a lot of Christians today. Yeah, I get it, man. The angels are around us. I know the little fat things with wings. I, I know I've seen in the little pictures they have. They're, they're with us. You know, I get it. I know the angels are with me, Phil. But do you know? You see, that's the question. Do you live as if you have recognized that God is with you now? Do you live that way? When we're walking, when we're working, when we're talking, when we're at home, when we're by ourselves, when we're in those silent moments of life, do we know the presence of God is with us at that moment? See, it's the distraction of the enemy that says to us, I get it, I believe it, I, I understand that God's with me all the time. See, but it, it's in those distractions that he causes men today to not live like God is with him. To not live like God is standing with him. That that power that exists for all of us is with us. And so Jacob is going to need to know this for what's about to go down. Because it, go, it always goes that way, doesn't it? When God reveals himself to you, when he's showing himself that he's with you, well, you better get ready. Because he wants you to know that he's with you because he understands that you're going through warfare. And that you're being attacked. And that your marriage is being attacked. And that your life is being attacked. So he wants you to know, I'm with you. Because as we take a step further, as we continue to walk this journey, well, hey, we're going to see life right in front of our face. We're going to see this world right in front of our eyes. And this world is offering nothing peaceful for us today at all. And if it is peace, it's a false peace. <laughs> and if it is security, it's a false security because this world has nothing tru truthful in it whatsoever. So he's saying to Jacob, I'm with you. And Jacob recognizes it now. So we should be reading this rest of this chapter, bro. Let's just do this this way. If I saw some angels right now, <laughs> bring it on, man. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Let's go to Vegas and Street Witness right now. If I, if I saw two angels, okay, however they look, man, just kind of come right here and we all saw them, we would, things would change in our lives tonight, okay? Because think about it. The reality of seeing the, these heavenly hosts, okay, with your eyes, man. We should be reading now in this next chapter that after this, Jacob took up his sword and slew everything evil in front of his face. <laughs> you know? Verse 3. So Jacob now, after he recognizes that God is with him, sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother. All right? And we all know the story of Esau. The last they, knew, the last they interacted with each other, it didn't go good. Unto the land of Seir, the, the country of Edom, which is later to be known as the flesh, man. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith, Thus I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, I have, I have donkeys, flocks, and maid servants, men servants. I have women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I, am, that I may find grace in thy sight. Okay, so he just saw two angels with him. Recognize that God's, is, God is with him and God's power is with him. Now he's going to request permission from his brother, that he could pass through his land. Esau, man, bro, I'm coming through. Uh, now, I can't tell you, the Bible doesn't really give us too much uh, information as to what, at this point, is Jacob's mindset. We don't know. I mean, it doesn't really indicate. It just tells us that he's making a request. Some commentators are going to tell you he's already afraid. Okay, he's already worried about, you know, crossing through the land, which is why he made the request from the beginning. Others are going to say he just did it as a type of, this is what they did back then, whenever they crossed through anybody's land. Uh, I'm kind of leaning towards maybe the first. I think Jacob already went into this a little reluctant. 
I think because of the history, because of what had happened, uh, because we know Jacob, I think he's already trying to be proactive about avoiding a conflict. That's just kind of his personality up to this point. It's the, how the brother's been since we've gotten to know him in the reading. He's been sort of one of those guys that's thinking ahead and trying to avoid anything bad. And so I think what's, what he's really doing is that he's just, he's going, okay, cool. All right, angels, here, go get some water over there. I got some business to attend to. Okay, I got to go make, make it right with my brother real quick, okay? I, I, need, I need to make sure that I could pass through this land. So I need to, and, as, and at the same time, I need to let him know, you know, what I have, what, who I am now. Now notice, and the messengers that he sent to see Esau returned to Jacob saying, we came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, man. <laughs> we went to him. Now he's saying he's coming to meet you. Uh, oh, man, where verse man? Oh, and 400 men with him. Not good, not a good message. Then Jacob, verse 7, was greatly afraid and distressed. You know, it's, it happens so often, a lot, because of our emotions, I believe. The reality of God, who he is to us in our lives, in our situations, in our scenarios, is quickly stripped away when fear and distress comes upon us. When fear and distress of life, when fear and distress of, of, a, sit, of, of a mental fear and distress, uh, confusion, uh, uncertainties, which create a lot of fear and distress on people today, how fast the reality of God's presence is removed from our minds. It's gone. As if it was just a Sunday school story. You know, as if it was just a kind of a thing we sang or we sing to the Lord and, and then that was a good song and then we move on and do our thing. See, God knew where he was going. God absolutely understood the road that he was on. God wasn't shocked and confused by it. You know, we often think God doesn't always know what's going on in our lives. We think that God forgot, you know, on the path that he set us on, you know. Uh, or we think that we just did it. Eventually, we just put ourselves, uh, I got myself this job where I'm at, and, and I'm just handling business like I should, like any old good, good employee should. But we forget that it was God who put you right where you're at. It's God is who the one that puts you in that place you're at. It's God is the one who had you marry the person you married. You know, it wasn't you all hot stuff. It was the Lord who worked in your life to put you right where you're at today. But when we forget, when it, when it starts to get pushed away from the, the, the forefront of our minds, the enemy comes right in there to use fear and distress and stress. Stressed out Christians, man. We got them all over the place. We do. I've been there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've been there. It's interesting that the enemy, has, you look around and you got to ask yourself, well, does he still do this today? Absolutely. How many of us in this room know God, the power of him, the presence of, of him, but sometimes feel like we're all stressed out? Of course. It's very common. It's the same tactic that he has used even all the way in the beginning. Same thing. All with the same premise, though, you see? The same focus to remove the reality of God's power from your face and put it somewhere else. To remove the reality of who the Lord really is in the Scripture. The truth of God. Who He really is. All of this is, has the same premise. To remove that. To get us just to get back to this mundane Christian living. And so, of course, man, Jacob... You know, he had a little plan. He thought, maybe I should <clears throat> reach out to Esau, and maybe I should be, you know, uh, uh, proactive here. And, and then all of a sudden, here's this 400 guys coming at him. Now, you know, he doesn't know why they're coming at him. His messengers didn't say, hey, bro, when we were leaving, he rounded up 400 dudes. They all got a bunch of spears, and they all got a bunch of things. And, dude, they were, they were hauling, dude, uh, this way. They didn't say that. They just said, hey, he got, your brother's coming and he's got 400 guys with him. War. You know, isn't that interesting? Uh, sometimes life brings us news. And we don't always know what the news is. Uh, but sometimes immediately, what? What'd you say? 
Oh, dude, what did you just say about her? What did she just say to me? Who does she think she's talking to? Does she know I'm her husband? She needs to submit? Who do you think they're talking to? Do they know who I am in the church? I've been here a long time. been here longer than you, man. All of a sudden, you're ready to battle. You're ready to war. You're just, it's in our nature to just immediately get defensive. You know, get all offended by things. Because the enemy knows that that's how it works. He knows it. And so here it is, Esau, creating now the fear. Well, well remember, man, let's not let's forget this. This dude just saw two angels walking with him. Obviously, he didn't think they must have been tiny little angels. They must have been them little fat ones with wings. You know, and then you say, what is that? You know, two little cherubims. What are they going to do? You know, what are they going to do with, with, with me and, and my, my life? They must have been small because I'll tell you what, you see angels, bro, you, you think you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna rank up a little bit. You know, it's like Joshua, when he saw the Lord's presence, he said, he said, I saw a man standing with a sword on the hill. He said, Joshua, hey, are you for us or against us? He said, I ain't with nobody. But, you know, I'm, I'm, he recognized he's a son of man. Joshua's like, yeah, we're going to take over this land. Because he understood who was with him, man. The power that exists within God's presence. But Jacob, it went away. He saw the angels, gave him a high five, and then he, he got all freaked out about Esau. So he does what we know Jacob to do. And he does what we also commonly do. He got afraid, verse 7, distressed, as I mentioned, but I didn't finish. He says, and he divided the people that was with him, the flocks, the herds, the camels, into two bands. What does he do? He reacts to the fear. That's key, isn't it? It's one thing to, to, to be afraid. It's one thing to get confronted and to feel un, uncertain about something going on in your life. But it's another thing to react to it. You see, we get to make choices all along the way here. And here, as we know Jacob to be, he's an analytical person. He's very busy in his mind. He's very busy about being, you know, a, a, a step ahead. So the fear comes and he reacts and he says, well, I need to, I'm a, okay, what do I do? What do I do? What I, and, and how often does that happen you know, with men today? Uh, something comes your way, a situation that God has allowed and has brought to you. you may, what do I do? What do I do? Man, what, what am I, how am I, I going to fix this? So he divides them into two, and then he goes on to say in verse 8, he gives a reason. Because, guys, there's always a reason on why we do everything, isn't it? We don't, we don't as men, just do for no reason, man. And that's what my wife has to understand. <laughs> I got a reason for everything, okay? Hon? Don't forget that. His reason is... And he, and he says in verse 8, If Esau comes to the one company and smites them, then the other company which is left shall escape. I got reason to do this. Makes sense, doesn't it? Totally logical, isn't it? Totally uh, understandable, I would say, that I'm just protecting my people, man. I, I'm, 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 I'm reacting and I, I'm being resourceful. But you got to remember, all of this reaction and reason is stemming from still the one place, and that is fear. It's fear. Fear drives us to do so, so many bizarre things. Nobody wants to experience any discomfort today. We're afraid of it. If God is afflicting or shaking up or chastening or dealing with one of us, it's very, we're very fast to try to find relief rather than let the the, let the, the sword and the chisel do its work. We'd rather find an escape. We, want it. we don't like the hurt. We don't like the pain. It's not, it's not in our nature. We don't like discomfort. So we run straight to medication. We run straight to painkillers, man. <laughs> you know, we run straight to something that's going to bring some relief from what I'm going through. And we have our reasons, don't we? Well, I can't work, man. I can't sleep. So one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten. And then you sleep. Yeah, you sleep. You just pop ten pills in. Of course you're gonna sleep. I can't sleep, man. Well, now I have time waking up. And you're, you know, you're taking all kinds of. Now you got a pill to put you to sleep, pill to wake you up, pill to get ready for lunch, pill to eat, a pill to do all kinds of stuff. Everything we do, we 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 find a reason, we find a justification to do something to alleviate ourselves from any kind of discomfort whatsoever. But we forget, man. That a lot of the times what's going on, man, is God is allowing these things to happen. He's a, I remember uh, it was taught by a 
Pastor Sandy, Sandy, Sandy Adams, right? Why am I getting that confused with, I'm trying to, I'm thinking Samuel Adams. What's that? That's the beer? <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Sandy Adams. I was going to say Samuel Adams. I'm like, something don't sound right. The Holy Spirit said, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Sandy Adams. <laughs> he, he said, he, and he, he did a message on bouts with the blues, you know, Christians having blue, the blues. And, he, and, he got, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not just picking medication. I'm just using it as an example. And he talked about medication, and he said a lot of Christians he knows are on it. And there's a place for it. There's a place for it. Let me just preface that. I'm not, again, I'm not against it, but there's a place for it. But his whole point was uh, we often run to those things first because we're just trying to, we're trying to divert ourselves from experiencing pain. That's it. Trying to, trying to divert and trying to get away from experiencing any discomfort, whether it's mentally or physically or whatever. There's a place for it, but this shouldn't be the first place. You see, there's a place for it, but it shouldn't be the first that we always go to, to try to, try to find our own resources to alleviate uh, the discomfort of a trial or whatever it might be. And, and then we got to be careful because a lot of the times we reason with ourselves to say this is why. And when you reason with yourself, you're reasoning with who? The most wicked person on the planet, right? So you can't reason with yourself. Don't reason in the mirror because you're going you're gonna to justify yourself all the way down to the end. And so he's saying... This makes sense to me. I, I need to split them up because he'll kill one and, and, and the other could escape. Verse 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham, and God of my father, Isaac, the Lord which saith unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. See, now, this is the place where Jacob stands out. This is the, the point where Jacob becomes Jacob, the one who later becomes Israel. You see, this is where first he, yes, absolutely, he requests permission to pass from his brother. The fear came in because of that. Then he reacts to the fear. Then he has reasons for his reaction. But now we see him resorting to prayer. We see him now coming to a place of saying, God, you're the one who, you're the one. You're the God of my father, man. And, and you called me to go to leave to my country, Lord. You're the one who set me on this path that I'm on. You're the one who obviously has allowed me to be where I'm working or to have the life I have, the family I have, the situation I'm in. Lord, it's because of you. Because that's right. Your word says that you're in control of all things. That's right. Your word says that, that you're the author and the finisher of my faith, meaning, meaning you know every detail to my walk. That's right. You know, you start remembering these things. And yeah, that's right, Lord. You said you would do, deal well with me. See, there's nothing like speaking to the Lord the promises he spoke to you. You know, there's nothing like it. Because you, it's, it's when the Holy Spirit starts reminding you, God said this to you. This is what he said. That just the same as he provides for the birds of the sky and how they don't have to worry about what's going on, it's the same way for you. How much more for you? See, when we start remembering those scriptures about God's provision and about God's peace, you know, that you will find yourself in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him who trust in him. He starts, the Holy Spirit starts remind you of all these things in prayer. And now verse 10, this is why Jacob's Jacob. He says, And am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. I'm not worthy, Lord. See, yes, he reacted. Yes, he had reason to react according to his own mind. But see, the one thing he's, he recognized in Jacob's learning now, after all these years of being Jacob, is that he's not worthy. I can't, Lord, I can't do it. I just don't got it anymore. You know, yeah, I'm trying to come up with a plan. I'm thinking if I divide the people, I could save one. But Jacob doesn't want to lose half the people. They're still his family. Remember, he left Laban with the people he loved. So when he makes this plan to separate the two and to think that maybe one would get smote and the other would live he's basically saying half my family will die and the other half will live he doesn't want that who wants what who wants that you know that's not how he's reasoning with himself and so he comes to this place where he's like he's just sitting there thinking he's going lord how about i just can't do it how about how about lord you're the one who told me to leave laban's 
How about, Lord, uh, you're the one who said that I'm going to be well. And then he says, and I'm not worthy. Lord, I just can't come up with the right plans anymore. I just can't come up with the best way to, to fix the situation anymore. See, that's where I believe the resorting to prayer becomes effective. When we finally come to the Lord empty of all of our, or actually I should say exhausted, man, of all of our attempts and resources and ideas. When you're finally done and, and, and you just say, I, I can't do it. I don't have, I don't have it anymore. He says, for with my staff, I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. He's saying, Lord, I'm not worthy. I came over here alone, and this is where we got to come to this reality with God. Uh, now, now, notice, this is very important, what he said here. Um, because, guys, when you came to the Lord, at least for, the, for most of us, it's different for everybody. But when you came to the Lord, you more than likely came to the Lord because you were broken. Most, most people came to the Lord because they're broken. Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. So you came to the Lord because you realized you were lost. No matter if you were doing good or not, you know, essentially you were still lost inside. That's how we come to God. Empty, lost, and broken. He's saying, when I went over to Laban's, it was just me. I crossed over Jordan. I didn't have nothing. And he's saying, now I have two bands. Now, Lord, I come back and I got all kinds of stuff. See, we come to the Lord broken, but eventually, guys, we come back and we say, but now, Lord, I got a family now. I got kids now. Now, year, years have gone by I've been walking with the Lord. I got a job again. <laughs> I got my sanity back. You know, all the, what, what, I went empty, but now I've come back and I have all these things, Lord. But notice, it doesn't change who God is to you just because you got more stuff. Or because you got a family now. Or you got more responsibilities. That doesn't change who God is. You see, and that's what he's saying. I went empty-handed. Now I got all kinds of stuff, Lord. I'm not worthy. And God is going to clearly show him. That's right. You came by yourself, and you have plenty now. But it's because of me. And God knows what he has. God knows what you have. He knows what you've taken on in your life. He knows that you came to him broken and empty, and he changed you and made you into something different. He's making you into a new creature. As the Bible tells us, we're, gonna, we're a new creation and he knows who you become now. It's not a surprise to the Lord. He knows what you got. He, see, the enemy wants to get us to a place where, where we go, oh, man, Lord, I came empty-handed and I came broken, but now i got a family. How are you going to take care of all of them? Well, no. That, that doesn't change anything. So he says, I, uh, I have now become two bands. And look at verse 11. Deliver me. <laughs> That's what he should have said a long time ago. Deliver me, I pray. From the hand of my brother. See, that's the prayer. Uh, it should have been verse 2. <laughs> he had two angels that he's seen, two hosts with him. The next thing he should have said was, hey, deliver me from my brother. Instead, all that in between, you know what I call that? I call that life. All the verse, verse 3 through, through uh, 8, I call life. Because it happens. Fear happens. Situations happen. Trials happen. Uh, our resources, our, our plans get thrown on the table. That happens. But, you know, we would save ourselves a lot of time if we would just say, Lord, uh, I recognize you're with me. And the second thing that comes out of our mouth is, Lord, deliver us continually. Deliver me continually. I'm nobody. I didn't become somebody. And, and just because I've been walking with the Lord for 10 or 15 years didn't make me, I'm not somebody now. I'm still a nobody. I still need to be delivered from myself constantly, daily. Just because I have head knowledge of the scripture doesn't make me anything. <laughs> this is, there's no power in head knowledge. Head knowledge is all it is. I can memorize it all day long. Watch, I'll quote a whole chapter. There's nothing in that. There's no power in my head knowledge. The power still comes from the person who delivered me, who saved my soul. And when I came to the Lord, I, it was one of the, and like probably a lot of us, it was one of those realizations that you have, like, dang, man, there's really a God. Because he really took me from a situation that I just could not. And the big surprise, for some reason or another, is that he still does that and still wants to do that. 
And so, deliver me, I pray thee, verse 11, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. There you go, Jacob. Be honest, man. I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. He's going to kill my whole family. Now, verse 12, and we're going to finish here. And this is where, where he says, where this is the, this is the big, big picture here, man. And thou sayest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Okay. He's broken. He needs to be delivered. He's rec- and he's confessed to the Lord, I was just afraid. Okay. He's admitted his wrong, which is very, very important that we understand that. But the, the last thing he does here in verse 12 is he quotes the promise of God. He quotes the promise of God. See, very heavy to understand the promises of God. The promise of God is victory for the believer. See, the promised land was victory for the children of Israel. Did all of them make it to the promised land? No. They died in the wilderness. They were wilderness Christians. Did the leader that delivered them and took them out of the exodus, did he get them into the promised land? No. He can take them out, but he couldn't take them in. See, I was just sharing with the leaders before the study a very, very interesting perspective. When Rahab, the, the girl on the other side in, in Jericho, right? Am I saying that? Jericho? When she's in Jericho and the spies went in there, after they, you know, were going to, Joshua now has taken the command uh, post, and he was the general now, and he's going to deliver the people and take them into the land. He sends these guys in there, and they go in there, and they meet this lady, okay? The lady of the land. She knew what was going down. She'd been there for a long time. And they, dis- they discovered something very unique when they were with her. She's telling them while she's talking to them, she says, oh, you guys are from the children of Israel. Oh, we know about you. See, she tells them, way long ago when your God opened that Red Sea for you guys, we started shaking in our boots. When, when he opened that Red Sea, we just about fell on our faces. And we have been afraid of your God. And we have been waiting for this day that you guys would come and take this place from us. And we are in fear of you guys. Okay, these two spies, they learned this 40 years later. Now, what's the wrong with this picture? See, the victory was already won. The promise was already fulfilled that they would possess the land. God had already been working on everything else, the whole situation, the whole scenario. He'd already had it lined up for them to walk right in there and possess that promise and live in that victory. But it was because of their wilderness attitude and their wilderness perspective that caused them to die there. And the children of Israel never made it into a victory. That was already won for them. It was already won for them. These two spies' hearts probably broke for their dads and their grandparents. They probably thought, man, if my dad would only hear this, that this whole time these people have been afraid, then maybe they would have came a lot long ago. Like like Caleb and Joshua said, we are well able. Let's go take this land. God said it's ours, so it's ours. But all the spies deceived the people. And the people didn't want to go. See, this lesson that they learned is a lesson that Jacob is finding true in his life and is a lesson that we too have to take away. And that is this, bro. The victory, despite all these things that happen, the promise is already there. It's already won. Don't be a wilderness Christian. Don't be somebody who is reluctant or hesitant to receive this power, this victory, this life that God has to offer. Don't let the wilderness keep you from experiencing the promise, the promise that God made to Jacob, the promise that he makes to us today, that we have the power. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And that's why he says, because he has conquered the grave. The promise of of the land, we live it through Christ. Because he says, don't be stuck at just believing that I died for your sins and just call that fair enough. 
Thank you, Jesus. No. Know that I died for your sins, but I also died to live in you to give you victory today in life, not just afterlife. But we might become sometimes as those wilderness Christians where we might discover this 10 years, 20 years, 50 years in our walk with God and go, man, this whole time I've been letting this life just drown me and, and weigh on me and, and cause me to fear and, and lie to me this whole time. Now I'm 50, 60 years old and I just learned that I had this victory this whole time. Don't be like the children of Israel. Get it now. Know it that it's not for you to live this walk. It's for Christ to live it through you, to live it for you. You're not the one that's righteous. He's righteous. You're not the one who saves souls. He saves souls. You're, you're not the one who, who changes things and, and, and who uh, gets people to follow you. He's the one. And if we want to be victorious. If we want to avoid, and Jacob has learned this now, if we want to avoid making de decisions that are weird and that are going to complicate things, then let us live in the promise that God has already given to us. The promise, the power of the Holy Spirit. The promise of his son who wants to live and make decisions on your behalf. The decisions you have to make, the life you have to live, the affliction you have to go through, the fear, the lies of the enemy we have to deal with. There's only one person who can dispel those lies. There's only one person who can give you the strength you need, the energy, the power you need, and that's the Lord Jesus who's in you right now. That's why he says we are what? Our bodies are a temple of the what? The Holy Spirit. We're just the shell for it. The power's in there. You got to let it out. You see? You got to let it go. You got to say, okay, Lord, like Pastor Jeff taught last night about the power that Paul had, the discerning gifts that he had. That was all from the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jeff did this thing last night, and we were talking about it today, on how many people responded last night to stand up and say, I want the Holy Spirit to live through me. Because people and Christians today are tired of trying to live this walk themselves. Because trying to live this walk yourself leads to constant failure. And Jacob is saying, Lord, you said this to me, that you were going to make good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which, which cannot be numbered for multitude. You said it, Lord. And that's what we have to do. He said that we are more than victors, that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. He said it, not me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He said that we have power to, uh, to the faith to move mountains. He said it, not me. But do I have that power? Absolutely not. But does he? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. So I have to surrender my will to his will. I have to be dependent on him and not independent of him. Constantly, daily. So Jacob, learning his lessons well. Failure? Sure. Inevitable, right? We're going to fail at times, man. But we learn our lessons well. And we come out of them and say, man, whew, that was a rough one. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I didn't mean to get all crazy on you. Or I'm sorry, bro, man. That was a bad decision. That was, I don't know what I was thinking. But anyway, let's surrender to the Lord and ask for his power. That's, and that's how it ends. And we say, Lord, then you live through me. Be righteous through me. Be holy through me because I'm not. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight uh, for this word, for these examples, for Jacob, but mostly, Lord, for you, <laughs> because your testimony is what stands true, and your testimony is what stands till this day, even at that time. And, Lord, what's really encouraging is that those promises and that power that you provided, the, the witnesses you provided, your testimony that, back then, is the same today. And, Lord, not even, uh, it's actually, now you've provided your son, Lord, in the power of your Holy Spirit. You've sent now to, to live, to give us these things that we lack, to, to, to provide for us the ability to walk with you, to, un, to make decisions, to experience you, to be a part of the ministry, to grow in you. All of these things are going to come from you. Lord, you desire to do it. And so we thank you because... You, you've really made it, um, I don't know, you really made it easy for us. Uh, you died on the cross. We didn't have to endure pain. And so that crucifixion gives us the, the pathway to heaven. And then you said that you would rise again, that you would live. It's like you wanted to, you want to do all of it. 
And you just want our hearts to surrender to you. That's it. To confess, to surrender. Lord, to, uh, to be living sacrifices is what you said. So, Lord, we pray tonight for that power. We ask, Lord, that we would experience it, that we would see you shine in our lives, that we wouldn't have to feel the pressures of this life because we would know that you are the one that wants to get through these, uh, break these walls down. So deliver us, Lord, from evil. Lead us, Lord, not into temptation as the enemy continues to lie to our minds. But, Lord, dispel him, Lord, and we just pray that your word and promises would be just shouting in our minds and written on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.